probably hear about other than I know that you've been praying, and I want to thank you for that. Um, but I want to give a word this morning. Uh, I, this is not just a sermon. This is a word from the Lord to our body. Uh, we're in transition right now with what's going on back there. Um, we have had conversations with the Morgan brothers. It's a really slow-moving pro- pro- uh, process because the roof has to be replaced. All the damage that happened out there is a direct result of the leaky roof from a hailstorm that happened in August. That was one of the more intense things, but it's actually been leaking for a long time. So anyhow, without any warning, we had to make the... Well, we didn't... The warning was about an hour after I stepped off the pulpit, that side of the, the ceiling caved in. I'm just glad I wasn't there. Somebody goes, this is a sign from God. You know, <laughs> going to get the pastor out of here one way or the other. So just, uh, just pray with me right now. Lord, I pray that just the words that you want spoken will be spoken. Most of all, Lord, we want your presence. And we establish that now. Jesus, you are the reason why we're here. Holy Spirit, you are free to move among us. And Father, we thank you for your care for us in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So I want to just begin with a brief uh, uh, introduction to say that the real danger in what happens right now with churches, there's another large church in our area that has uh, had to put their building up for sale, three and a half million dollars for a building that you'll see as you're heading north on 27. Their congregation went through a real shift and down to 70 people, and that's a building, or a church that's been in this community a long time. What's behind all that? I think the enemy, like more than ever, wants to make churches give up, make pastors quit, make congregations feel like it's more fun to to do something else other than to gather together to worship. And by the way, gathering together in worship just doesn't happen here. It should happen everywhere where we gather together regularly. In fact, I'll, I'll say more about it in the moments. But one of the things that's most dangerous is not to lose a building, but to lose the sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit revealing Jesus and the fullness of God the Father's presence in our midst. Gathering without the presence of the Lord is not church. Jesus Christ's church manifests the fullness of all that he is and all that he is doing, all that he has done, all that he's still doing. And we must, as a church body, really guard our oneness at this time. You know, the early church was not perfect, but the early church understood this concept of community. And when I was thinking about we were setting up chairs, I thought, man, what's it going to be like to have 50 people sitting close together instead of 50 people spread over 70 seats. Well, I didn't plan this, but it happened that now you get to look to someone next to you and say, who are you? It's nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. You know, the whole, per- the whole power of the early church was this. They had a witness of the resurrected Christ. And the Bible says in Acts, and with great power, the early disciples and apostles witnessed of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon all of them. And then verse 33 and 34 of Acts 4 says, Neither was there any among them that lacked, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, and neither said any of them that any of the things that they possessed was their own, because they had all things in common. So we must guard, uh, right now these days, to guard our oneness, our unity and purpose. And by the way, I want to remind you, the scripture says in uh, Proverbs 29, 18, without a clear word of the Lord, people perish. We know that verse is without a vision, the people perish. But it says when the people do not understand or see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. That's another translation from the NLT. But I also want to remind you of something, that there is an opposition. In fact, there are five quick things I want to deal with. The inevitable opposition that we face because we're believers, and there is an adversary who is the... Okay, this side got an A, this one. (laughs) Our adversary, the... And he seeks whom he may... See, I knew you had it. So we've got to remember something. There's an inevitable opposition. 
Number two, there is provision. Number three, we are called by God to return to the stronghold because of his covenant with us, our covenant with him. The Bible says in Zechariah 9, verses 11 through 12, that we are returning, we, we are called to return to the stronghold because of the covenant God has given us. This is not about us in our flesh being able to navigate. It's about returning to the one who gives us the strength, the purpose, the vision. Everything that we're about is because he birthed it in us. Can you say amen? Now remember this, 1 Samuel chapter 11, there's a story about how Naash the Ammonite came against the people of God in Jabesh Gilead. Many of you know the story. That he came to them and it was going to destroy them and they said, we'll make a deal with you. Uh, we'll serve you. Just don't kill us. And he came back and he said, here's what we'll do. We will let you be our slaves, but we will gouge out your right eye. What a deal. And you know why? The, first of all, Nahash, you like this. The, the name Nahash means the serpent. Who is the one who opposes us? The serpent. The one who comes to lie, to steal, and destroy. So he offers this horrible thing, and it turns out, he says, listen, I'll give you blindness, bondage, and no defense in a battle where you have to fight. What does that mean? It means this, that if you're, a, if you're a person who's going to go to battle in those days, you have to draw a bow and an arrow. Without a right eye, you have no way to defend yourself. So they're saying, not only will you not have a vision, not only will you be slaves, but you will have no way to fight the battles. But we are not in bondage. We are not in blindness. We are equipped by the Lord, and he's making our vision clearer and our focus more direct to why we've been called. And then I want to just briefly point out or point out <laughs> the contrast between the Mary and Martha church. And it's important for this reason. We want to understand that the church that makes Jesus' presence the most important thing is a church that will have a great impact in the world around us. I'm going to read a couple scriptures. Isaiah 54, 17 says this, Behold, they shall surely gather together against you, but not because I sent them, not by me. Whoever shall gather together against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster who destroys. Now the Lord says, I've got this because not only have I created and given you a covenant, I've promised you that adversity will come, but it will not be coming because God wants to destroy us. Well, why did it happen? Because God allows those things that will make us stronger. And he also says, listen, I know the one who's fashioned, the blacksmith who's fashioned a weapon designed specifically to wipe you out. Have you ever wondered why certain trials you go through seem to be the ones you go through? And while everybody goes through stuff, the ones that you're facing are different than someone else may face. Because the enemy knows what is your weakness. And the reason he knows that is because we tell him. We tell him, oh, I'm worried about finances. Oh, finances is your problem? I'm worried about my marriage. Oh, your marriage? So what does he do? He comes in and whenever we confess where there's a weakness, he said, okay, I'll step into that. And I'll just try to destroy because you said this is what my, my fear is. But with all that, he said, no, here's the interesting thing. Satan was a created being who rebelled. But nothing has changed from God's divine purpose. Even when Satan rebelled, God said, I will use what he does for my purposes. Now, I can't jump around a lot because I don't have much room in here. But I want you to get excited about the fact that everything the enemy tries to do against you, against me, against this congregation... Whatever weapon it is that he has chosen. And a lot in the Western modern church, we think that it's about buildings and budgets and, and uh, bodies. You know, everybody, if, if you have a big church, then all of a sudden you're a success. You know what? We measure uh, strength by how many numbers there are. God weighs. God weighs disciples. <laughs> Let me restate that again. God weighs disciples. We count them. He says, who's got, who, who carries the glory of the, and the power of the Lord? With all of that that's said in this verse, 
I want you to notice a very simple, simple outline. Number one, the enemy will come, but it won't be because God said, I'm going to send them after you. God didn't send it, but he will allow his agenda to be over to override anything the enemy is trying to do. It says in the scriptures that the enemy will fall for our sake. Then verse 17 is one we all know. In fact, the problem is we know it all too well, so we don't pay attention to the fact this is the eternal word of God. He says, I've created the one that makes the weapon. I understand that there's going to be opposition, but no weapon formed against you shall prosper. No weapon. Whatever weapon we have confessed to, whatever weapon we think we're most vulnerable to, he said that was fashioned in hell to destroy you, but no weapon formed by the enemy will be able to conquer you. But I like the next part too, because one of the things we all deal with in our brain here is the things that we either hear in our mind of the doubts and fears or the things that we hear people say about us. Uh, He's worthless. They'll never get that together. You know, we're doomed. You know, we're destined. We're going to hell in a handbasket or whatever. I don't know if that's the right one. Anyhow, no weapon formed. But he says this, but every tongue that will rise against you to judge you, to condemn you, you will condemn. Because this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. As I quoted earlier, that Zechariah passage, the Lord says this, because of my covenant of blood with you, I will strengthen you. I will bring you the victory that you need. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. So you get very simply this very truthful thing. There will be opposition. It won't be because it was God's idea. It will come because the enemy is our adversary and he's looking for a way to destroy us. The second verse is in Psalm 27, verses 13 and 14. I have read this for months, over and over and over again. I've looked at commentaries, none of them satisfied, something that was just pounding within my heart. First of all, it says this, I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. How many like to hear that word? I hate that word. Would you come and help me? Wait a minute. You know, when Daniel prayed and asked the Lord to to give him uh, insight as to what was happening, it took 21 days before the answer came. But the moment the answer came, the angel said to Daniel, the moment that you prayed, we were sent. So that you had to wait a little bit for the things to get done. I ended up showing up because I have perfect timing. Aren't you glad that it wasn't too late for Lazarus? He was dead four days, but the Lord said, no problem. When you're the resurrection of life, you don't have to worry about how many days something's been dead or how seemingly absolutely impossible it is. So I would have fainted. I would have been discouraged. Uh, One translation says, I would have lost heart. I was ready to give up. But I believed in the goodness of the Lord. Now that's something we all need to say, yeah, to to know the goodness of the Lord gives us great hope and peace. But I like the fact that the latter part of that verse says this, I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I know there are people who say, yeah, we're going through difficulties and trials, but one day, praise God, we will go to heaven and it'll be all over. But this scripture says, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That means right now. In fact, if you look at anything that David wrote about in the Psalms about the things he was facing, it is interesting that he's the one that said, I know I'll see this God's intervention in the land of the living. I'll see it before I die. Now, there was a famous guy named Job in the Bible, and you know all the stuff he went through. In fact, at one point in the scripture, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Great, great confession. I know that my Redeemer lives. And then he says in the next verse, and even though the the, the canker worms and disease will eat the skin off my bones, yet I know 
that I will see the victory of the Lord on this earth. I will see, here's what, do you remember that he had these boils on his body? I won't get into the details because we have to eat lunch later. But <clears throat> there was such severe boils in his body that he was literally rotting. And he's in that condition of just a hopeless, how is this ever going to change? He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I will see him, not someday when I die, but I will see him now in the land of the living. What good is a theology that says, well, wait for some happy day later when the Bible says the kingdom comes now. It's now and coming. It's now in part, but it's coming in fullness. But right now, our expectation is, well, I know if I die, it's all over. What about living in the promise that God will invade our situation now? Because he promises that we will have that manifestation of the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So he says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I said to the Lord. You know, I wish that we would, he would strengthen our heart first. But he says, wait on the Lord. And that literally means to tie yourself. It's the same word that's used in uh, Isaiah 41 where it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The concept of one who binds himself, ties himself, bolts himself, ropes himself to God. I'm not, I will not leave you. It's like Jacob said when he's wrestling with God. I, I will not let you go till you bless me. And when we hang on with a tenacious conviction that God is at work, and even though I can't see it or feel it, I know God's at work. Listen, we don't have a building right now. But we have a promise that CCR is going to be in this community until Jesus comes. I want you to agree with that. This isn't about some corporate thing. It's not about denomination. And all that. It's about this expression of the kingdom of God in this city. And we are declaring that we will be here because God put us here. He called us here. You're part of it because God chose you. You may think that, well, I do this guy, so I thought I'd give him a break. <laughs> Thank you. But God put you in this place. In the land of the living. This is the part that I could not get a good answer from any of the commentaries read. The land of the living. Where I live right now, I want to see it. Too often, folks, we give up. And I've talked about this in talk, uh, uh, sermons I've done about prayer, that we pray and then we give up. The Bible says if we will lean in and intercede, and there's another word called supplicate. Supplicate means I'm going to stay in this prayer thing not because I'm praying in unbelief, but because there's more involved than, my, than God answering. God already heard the opposition, the situations that God has to work in so that his will will be done, insists and calls us with all prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. We wait on the Lord to see what he's going to do because sometimes the opposition needs to know that we are not going to be giving up. We're not giving up. Devil, you can hear this. The one who called us, enabled us, and we are not throwing in the towel. So we have the opposition. We have the provision in the land of the living. We have that promise that he will see us through to the end. I love that thing about the stronghold, that we return. What is the stronghold? It is knowing the covenant of the Lord, but it is also knowing the presence of the Lord. How many times have you been going through a thing and it was so intense. But the thing that got you through is that in the midst of all you were feeling, you had this sense that God was there. How many have ever experienced that? Man, he, 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 listen, that is a promise. He prepares a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. And he there anoints my head with oil so that my cup runs over. We're not just dribbling along here. <laughs> Our cup overflows with his presence. So there's the, the provision with the returning to the Lord. And then let me try to make an important contrast here this morning because I want to, again, say this. Above everything that we have here, 
The one thing I want more than anything is to have the manifest presence of Jesus here. That when people come in, they know that this more, it is more than just a group of people. It's more than a preacher who's preaching. It's more than the songs we sing. But when they come through that door, whether it's here or wherever it is, they come in and all of a sudden they go, something's different here. I, I've experienced that when I've gone to homes of people in this church. When you walk through the door, you sense the peace of God in that house. The presence of the Lord is something, you know, Moses said this to the Lord, and we all know this, and we've quoted it a million times, quoted it a million times. In Exodus 33, the Lord says, I'm going to take you out of this land and bring you into the other. And Moses says this, if your presence does not go with us, then do not lead us out. In other words, you can bring us to the greatest promises that we've ever experienced, our promised land. That flows with milk and honey, but if you're not there, it's not the promised land. Hallelujah. Can you praise him for a moment right now? The Lord, if, it's, if, if you're not there, it's not the promise. The promise is that wherever we are, even in the wilderness, even in the difficult times, it's when we're in your presence that we can look at those dry and barren places and know, but the Lord is with me. He will not leave me nor forsake me. Now, real quickly, we've got to make the, pri the priority of our existence to be based on the pre presence of the Lord. Knowing this, the presence of the Lord doesn't keep us in a little um, cloister of us four and no more. The presence of the Lord goes with you when you're shopping at wherever, when you're filling your car with gas. Where, wherever you go, the presence of the Lord is in you and upon you. So... It's not like we're thinking only in terms of when we gather in a church meeting. But I was very uh, drawn to this again as I was studying this week that uh, the scripture says, and this is out of Luke 10, 38, it says, it happened that when Jesus entered into a certain village, a certain woman was there named Martha. She welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Note that. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha, God bless her. Someone's in the kitchen with Martha. Well, no, that's not, no. <clears throat> Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached Jesus and said, by the way, that's a very kind way that is, is uh, interpreted in Scripture. It actually is much more graphic. It says, she came to the Lord and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. You see, that posture of the Martha is to make demands. And one translation say, says it this way. She came standing over Jesus, demanded that he make Mary help her, and insinuated that Jesus didn't care about her labor. Jesus cared very much about the fact that she was working. But when you're a person who can feed 5,000 with some loaves and fishes, you really don't mar need Martha in the kitchen preparing a meal. So let me just contrast something. Martha was conscious of her gift of hospitality. By the way, we need the gift of hospitality where we open our homes to one another. This, by the way, I'm going to take just a brief deviation here. The, the only way we're going to survive as a church is if we get bigger by being smaller. We must be in fellowship and community with one another. And I want to tell you, I've tried this, and it, we haven't had good luck, but I want to tell you something. We must make our homes a place where we gather together to celebrate the Lord where we gather together to be just who we are as, as God's people, that we will have times of interaction. If, you, uh, if it's in your head, I don't want to do that. I'm not, that's not me. Uh, I'm a private person. I don't want to be exposed to others. Then you're probably in, in you're, you really don't know what the church is, and you're probably going to be living a very lonely and vulnerable life because you're not designed, none of us are, to stand alone without the community of faith. The Bible is very clear on that. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That doesn't mean in church, though it could be and should be, but that we should be assembling together 
and not neglecting as the matter of some is, because, to, listen, even the world gets, look at me hard, even the world gets this better, because at least we know they're going to meet at Joe's Bar. <laughs> you remember the song that, it was, uh, uh, that they played at this, uh, one of the TV series, um, Where Everybody Knows Your Name? I forget the name of that. Yeah, Cheers. You know, I was going to have that thing played this morning where everybody knows your name. And, and you, you, well, it's certainly not redemptive, but listen, there's something that even the world gets that we don't get. And that is when you're really going through it, you go to a place where the people have like needs and like problems. And you have, Now, this is not a commercial. Don't any of you be going to the, beer, no, to the bar instead of the church. But, and by the way, I don't know of any of you that are hankering to go to Joe's bar. But the thing is... We're called to be in fellowship with one another and the hope for our church in the future. Listen, if you don't like what I'm preaching, go somewhere else. I love you, but this isn't about me. This is about the church being the church. It's about our mission and commission that God has called us to. And as long as we keep that, that goofy idea that we are an island to ourselves, we will always be vulnerable to deception and discouragement. That may be the most difficult thing for you to hear this morning is this, the, the, the fact that we are, not, we are not supposed to just be isolated little people doing our thing on our own, and it's just me and Jesus on the Jericho Road, baloney. You have your personal Savior role that we have with Jesus, but we are to be intimately involved with other people where we can talk about needs and share our heart and pray and, and even this, get this, this will throw you off. Even to get together and have fun. One of the things, <laughs> don't be doing that. You know, This is church. We don't have no fun in church. <laughs> One of the great joys I've had with my family is over the years when we go get together, and this goes way back to when Christy and Kimmy were little girls and Jeremy was a little runt boy. Um, we would gather at the house and they would come out and say, we're going to sing for you today. <laughs> or... We have a play we'd like to do. And we'd sit around and they'd do these things and we'd just celebrate it. And now we have little Baylor and Brinston and, and uh, Leo and Lion. Well, Leo. What's, his, what's the other? Leo and Lincoln. Leo and Lincoln. These are, good, these are good guys. Leo and Lincoln. That's awful. So when you get together and you see these little guys doing their their thing and these little kids being what they are, it's, it's an awesome thing. It's a really awesome thing. So there's something that we learn to enjoy uh, when we're around one another. So let me move through this quickly. Martha's in there doing her thing. God bless Martha. But the Bible says that Jesus said, Mary has chosen the better part or the good part, which cannot be taken away from her. So quickly make these points, okay? In a Martha church, and I'm going to compare this, contrast this, and make it a Mary and a Martha church. The Martha church wants everything on schedule. I want to find a place to sit here in a minute <laughs> so I can dodge. Oh, we did, took the hymn books out so no one can throw anything at me. <laughs> Buildings, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Are you sure? Buildings are designed to attract people. Well, pff, yeah, this is a big attraction. <laughs> Come down, come down and be crowded in where you're sitting on someone's lap. This would be great. <laughs> Everything is done to accommodate that which people want, not necessarily what God wants. Do you remember the seeker-sensitive movement? It was all about what do people want? Give them what they want. What about Holy Spirit sensitivity? What does the Holy Spirit want? We see these kind of churches that are full of programs, nothing wrong with them. But when the program, the cantatas, the choirs, the tournaments, recovery groups, and all kinds of other things, instead of gathering together the worship of the Lord and receive of the word. And by the way, God's not against us getting together and enjoying all those things if they're a witness in establishing the presence. The Martha church has always got its eyes on the clock. The Martha Church is always worried about high-tech presentations and performances. I didn't expect any of this this morning. Mikey came in late last night and set all this stuff up. What a blessing. You need to give him a big hug for that because he wants to make everything to be as, as, as uh, 
positive in being able to communicate the gospel and do what we do as we worship. So those are good things, but it doesn't take a prim. In fact, you know what? He, he and I talked on the phone, and I said, Mike, we don't need any of that. We don't need it. Don't worry about it. We'll just get together with guitars, and we'll sing and play. And he said, I'm completely comfortable with that. And then came in and did all this. Just say, well, let's make it a little, let's make it a little easier for the old man to, to get, across, get the stuff done. The, the, these high-tech churches want marketing. Listen, marketing and advertising. Come here because we got this and come here we got that. What about what happened in Jesus' ministry when did you hear the demoniac at Gadara who scared everybody away? We came back and found him sitting and clothed in his right mind. He was begging Jesus to go with him. And Jesus said, no, go back to your home and tell everybody what he did. And you know what happened? He did what Jesus told him to do. He is brand new delivered of demons. He goes back to his home. And by the time Jesus gets to chapter 7 of Mark, he gets to the Decapolis, the 10 cities. And there are such great crowds there that he heals and delivers people of every kind of sickness, disease, and, dem uh, and demons. And it was because of a single man who got delivered. And people said, I know that guy. He was a nutcase. And look where he is now. He's out here. He's back with his wife. He and the kids were in the park the other day playing soccer. <laughs> I just made that part up. So anyhow, they see a change in his life. The advertising should be, you should go and see what God's doing. It doesn't mean I put out here on a, on a big sign saying, come for the healing ministries. Well, I believe in that too. But, hey, if you can't produce, don't put a sign. Do the sign first and let people follow the sign that points to Jesus. Amen. Signs have a reason. They don't point to themselves. You know, when I was coming to this town the first time, I saw Loveland. I didn't jump out and grab the sign. Oh, I have arrived. The sign pointed to the city. So I finally got to the middle of the city. It was beautiful. So signs and wonders are the things that draw. We must see Jesus. And several weeks ago, I started this series on sirs. What, we must see Jesus. What did you come to see? What did you come to see? The Martha Church says, get the sermons brief. Let the worship services be brief. And people are more spectators than participants. They're more consumers than ministers of the gospel. We wait for someone up here to do it. And folks, God has called us all to be worshipers and ministers of his new life. There's a highly competitive thing that goes on in the Martha Church. We have to have a mailing list and we got to have the, you know, do all we can to get a piece of the pie in the city. And very little prayer goes into it. But the Martha Church is very popular. It's a people-pleasing outfit. Their image conscience personality driven, busy with all kinds of activities, always accessible, able to do, to, to, to do all and to be all. Prayer and study time is often interrupted by other things, and oftentimes little preparation happens, so we pursue Internet sermons. I, I have been getting 15 of those uh, things on the Internet that says, here's a sermon thing that you can do as you come into Easter season. You know what? If I have to revert to an internet sermon, I'm quitting. Either a God speaks currently and he speaks to his people and his, his ones he's called to, to lead. Either we hear it from God and have a... Listen, they, their sermons are great. And if you listen to one, they're probably better than one I do. But one thing I can tell you, I didn't get mine from an internet. I got mine from the one who is the God who I serve. Oftentimes, kids are neglected. The wife becomes the soundboard, soundboard of the negativity in the church. Pastors suffer burnout. Pastors can become control freaks. <laughs> There's a lot of sheep shifting. I'm going here this week. I'm going there next week. And Jesus becomes the mascot of the church, not the Lord. Well, the last thing is this. The Mary church leader understands what Mary understood, and that is, I must be in the presence of Jesus. Before I do anything in the kitchen, I need to be at the feet of Jesus. I must hear the word, the heart of God. That's what makes us stay whole and healthy. I must be around other people who love the Lord, who can affirm what God is doing in us as a people. 
We become more God-focused when we do this, as Mary did. Not trouble-focused. There's not enough help in the kitchen. But Jesus is here. I'm at his feet. And I'm hearing stuff from him that forever changes my life. What you gain in the presence of the Lord cannot be taken away. But I can, I can tell you this. If all you do is work hard and you're never in the presence of the Lord, you will quickly burn out. Because all of us love that feeling of having done something. And, uh, and I think back when we rebuilt this whole building back there. When we were hanging sheetrock and the electricians in our church were putting in wiring and conduit. And we were hanging sheetrock and we were taping stuff. We were building. You know, we would come here after a long day of work and these guys would work into the night. And it was wonderful. God blessed their hands. But you know what? They needed to be rested as well. And you know what? God gave them the strength to do it. But you know, they didn't say, well, because I did this, now I'm excused from anything else. But not only did they help us build this out, but they were faithful by my side, not behind me, but by my side as we launched this church and declared that we were going to be Christ Church of the Rockies to this community. So I'm going to finally just say this. It all comes down to the presence of the Lord. When the children of Israel were being led out in chapter 13 of Exodus, you know, they had to face all this, the, the attack, uh, you know, Egypt coming after them, changing their mind. And they're standing there, and I mentioned this last week, they're standing there with the Red Sea flooded and the Egyptian army threatening. And God told Moses, stop yiking about it, take the rod, divide the waters, and lead the people across. Well, they got across on dry land, but guess what else happened? Once they got there, they were in a wilderness. It wasn't easy street. They had to endure some difficult things. But what's interesting is in the midst of the the difficult things, there was a cloud by night. I'm sorry, cloud by day. (laughs) Cloud by day. Thank you, Walt. Walt's going, no, no. (laughs) Cloud (laughs) by day and a fire by night. The fire kept the enemy from encroaching at night, and the cloud by day shielded them from the desert sun. His presence guided them, protected them, and provided for them. And I listed a whole bunch of these on Wednesday. You have the manna, the quail, the water from a rock. When the serpents were biting, they set up a pole, you know, look and live. I mean, you go through all the stuff that... All the time God is taking him through this, he's trying to say, listen, as desolate as it is, I am in this wilderness with you. So the thing that you have that is greater than the wilderness is the presence, my presence, to guide you. (laughs) Aren't you glad for that? Do you sense his presence today? Do you sense his presence? Listen, I am not interested in the traditional ways of doing things, even though I'm very traditional. And I say that for this. Let me qualify that because I do everything I do is old school. But the one thing that I'm going to contend for is the presence of the Lord. The Bible says this. I am glad and I rejoice in you and I will sing praises, O Lord Most High. So when my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. Because you've maintained my right and my cause. You said at the throat of judgment, judging right. You've rebuked the heathen. And you've destroyed the wicked, and you put their name out forever and forever. O oh, you enemy, your destructions are come to a perpetual land. That means every time he thinks up something new, God says, that one's done now. You can't use that again. <laughs> or he may try to use it again. But the Lord says, he's already won this battle. Psalm 9 verse 10 says, And they that know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those that seek you. You will show me paths of life. This is 1611. In thy presence presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures evermore. Let my sentence come forth from the presence of the Lord. Let your eyes behold the things that are true and equal. 
You will hide me in the secret of your presence from the pride of man. And you will keep me secretly in the pavilion from the strife of tongues. Man, I've got three pages. That's all I can do for now. Three pages of scripture that have to do with the presence of the Lord. Now, we're going to dismiss and pray. But I want to, in fact, I want to have us pray first. And then I want to make another announcement. So why don't you stand? I'm done for now. Let's stand and we're going to get ready to go. Uh, I've stood longer than I've stood a lot lately, and all my muscles and joints are saying, end this baby quick before you fall down. (laughs) So, just get before him right now in the presence of Jesus. You said, wait. Wait on the Lord. And so we do. We wait for you to act on our behalf and we will not fear because, Lord, you hold us in the hollow of your hand. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture, the people of your hand. And we thank you that this is just a bump at the road before a great, great spance opens before us that you will make for us as you increase our influence and impact in a community This is the cry of our heart, to be in one accord with your purpose and plan, Jesus. This is our desire. I pray for blessing and encouragement upon this body. I pray that this time of being so tight together, that it will equal out into even greater tightness in our relationships beyond these gatherings on Sunday. I ask that, Lord, in your mighty name. Jesus, bless this congregation. And show us your way in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Real quick before we go. I don't know how many of you are comfortable doing what we're doing right now. We can do this for a season. But we can't be housing in here just for our own comfort. But we have been offered a place in Fort Collins temporarily at the Foursquare Church in Fort Collins. That's on Harmony. The pastor's there. Uh, have said, there. You know, you're welcome to use the building on Sunday morning. It's about eight miles from here. I want you to think about it, pray about that. We have that offer to go there for our services if we want to, and we can still do what we're doing here. But this is not going to be permanent, and it cannot be because this limits who we can reach, as far as people attending. So give me some feedback at the end of this service, and let me know. Uh, if you're, if you feel like you're willing to go uh, up north to Fort Collins, or if you're saying let's just kind of sit here and see what has what God has for us, because the other thing is the Morgan brothers are supposed to give us uh, an idea about an alternate space right now, because whatever they do up here, in they're gonna have to rip out that entire ceiling. The roof has to come off, so it's fixed all the way to where the problems are, and then they can begin to do the renovation inside. Their insurance must cover all of that because it's related to the hail damage. It's not related to our neglect. All right. With that, I want to say God bless.